The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. During his lifetime, Idris Shah promoted contacts and connections between different traditions around the world, believing this to be an important element in the advancement of human culture. In this spirit, the Idris Shah Foundation has created Cultural Crossroads, a website forum where people from many walks of life are invited to talk about their own experiences crossing cultural boundaries and the lessons that they have learned as a result. You can find these articles on the ISF blog. This is our first Cultural Crossroads interview for this podcast. Guy Stagg was born in 1988 and grew up in Paris, Heidelberg, Yorkshire and London. He read English at Trinity College, Cambridge, and on graduating worked in politics and journalism. In 2013, he walked from Canterbury to Jerusalem. The Crossway, an account of this journey, will be published by Picador in 2018. An extract from the book was shortlisted for the inaugural Deborah Rogers Foundation Award. You can learn more about him at www.guystag.co.uk. What was the initial idea? Did you just decide to do the walk before you did the book or or, or, or conceive of the book idea or was it in parallel or, or how did it come about, the sort of the two things? So in the summer of 2012, yeah. I'd just, I was coming out of quite a long period of mental illness. I was off antidepressants, I'd stopped seeing a therapist and so I decided as a, a small celebration or maybe a way to test myself that I'd walk from my flat where I was living in London and I would walk to Canterbury. Uh, this is about 70 miles. Mm. I thought it would take me about two days. It'd be an easy thing to do. I hadn't hiked since school, but I didn't bother doing much preparation. And in fact, I had a terrible journey. I got rained on. <laughs> I got sunburnt. Mm. I got lost, I got very bad blisters. But when I stepped into the cathedral close, and this is the longest day of the year, so the light was still lasting in the sky, I'd lie down on the grass outside the cathedral and I feel a sense of relief so complete it was like healing. Mm -hmm. But you're not religious? I'm not religious, this wasn't a religious journey. Right. But outside the cathedral, there's a stone which reads Via Francigena, Canterbury to Rome. And that's what planted the seed of the journey. Mm. I didn't know anything about medieval pilgrimage, but I thought maybe I could keep going. So I went home, I went online, I found out about the Via Francigena, the old route to Rome, the Via Ignatia, the route from Rome to Istanbul, and then the patchwork of crusader routes that connected up the Middle East. Mm. And I thought, well, I could walk all the way to Jerusalem. Mm. So that was the initial idea. It was the idea that I could do this journey mm. and that this journey would be linked in some way to to healing from this period of mental illness, giving my life purpose, mm. giving it meaning, building me up mm. again. Mm. And the idea of writing a book was was nowhere in my mind at that point. It was only over the course of the journey, the things that happened to me mm. on the journey, that convinced me it was worth writing about. I mean, you mentioned you're not religious, but in the past, were you? Were you? Are you were, have you had a sort of conventional Christian upbringing, or is it just a? I've had a conventional Church of England upbringing. Right. So, churches for Christmas and Easter, mm. and otherwise, it doesn't get mentioned. Right. I went to a C of E school, so we we had chapel twice a week, and so you know I had some familiarity with the ritual, some familiarity with the you know hymns and liturgy, with the stories. But certainly no real no real interest in religion, no piety. Mm. And then by about the age of 16, I decided I didn't believe. And so then I, I stopped thinking about it really at all until this walk. However, the fact that I was setting out on, on a pilgrimage, I was going to mm. these religious sites, mm. and the fact that I, I hoped this religion would 
this this ritual, this sacrament, mm. would heal me in some way, suggests that there was some lingering uh, hunger for or appreciation of faith. Mm. And what I didn't understand when I set out, mm. but what I understood by the end, was that religious ritual can still have meaning, really, whether or not you believe. Mm. You may not buy the theology or mm. the metaphysics, but you can still find the the liturgical or sacramental mm. side of religion fulfilling. Mm. I mean, it's quite interesting. What you're saying is something something interesting, which is that basically we think religion lies in words, which is kind of what faith is, but actually religion lies in practice rather than, or at least may have its roots in practice rather than some kind of abstract faith. Yes. I think it's not surprising that if you grow up in a in a Protestant country, mm. essentially, that you think that uh, the word and maybe the doctrine or mm. the creed that goes with it is the most important thing. But what I began to understand as I was leaving behind the Protestant countries, I went through France and Switzerland, Italy, Catholic countries, and then into the Orthodox countries, the Balkans, and then into Turkey, into an Islamic country. More and more, I was moving into societies where faith was deeply embedded into the society. But more and more, I was having less experience of people talking about faith in terms of creed, and more and more people trying to live out their faith, people relating to it in terms of practices or identity or habits. Mm. And I think this, is a, this gives you a more complete understanding mm. of mm. what the life of an everyday believer mm. is. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. And how we, when we think about, say, Islam, we, we characterise it as something perhaps um, extreme, but in fact it's full of people just doing the same sort of thing, living their lives and observing these practices. Perhaps. Well, my experience of Islam was I was walking through Turkey and it was high summer. Mm. I didn't know any Turkish. I knew 20 words at mm. most. And I was walking through some of the most remote areas of my entire journey. Mm. And I knew that it was Ramadan, but I didn't know if that would have any mm. bearing on, on my own journey. Mm. And what happened was that every evening I would turn up in a village. I'd see a group of men sitting outside the mosque. They'd, they'd hear the adhan, the, the final call to mm. prayer of the day. They'd go in and pray as the sun was going down. Mm. Then they'd come out. They'd offer me chai. They'd invite me into their mm. homes. I'd share in their breaking of their mm. fast. I'd be given these enormous feasts, endless mm. amounts of food. And then at the end of the d day, I'd be taken to the Oda, the guest room attached mm. to the mosque, where I'd be given a place to sleep. Now, this is perhaps partly because Turks are very hospitable, they're very mm. friendly, perhaps partly because there's an Islamic emphasis on hospitality, mm. especially to strangers mm. and travellers. Mm. But it seemed to me what this really was is that these people's faith was very embedded into the way that they lived their lives. Mm. I don't know what their what their pos positions were on, on doctrine mm. or you know some of the claims of Islam, mm. but obviously it was very important to them that if they had an opportunity to practice mm. charity or kindness mm. to a stranger, then, then that's what they do almost instinctively. What was your method of travelling through Europe? It was very similar. Mm. I started walking in winter mm. in the on the 1st of January and it was, it was a bad winter, it was a cold one, lots of snow and the snow stayed on the ground mm. for a long time. As a result it was impossible for me to sleep outside. I had mm. a tent but it was mm. too cold to mm. camp. The campsites were closed, most of the hostels were closed mm. as well. And I had a list of some places which I thought I'd be able to stay mm. along the way. Mm. But because I started walking in the winter, the days were short, mm. got dark early. Mm. If I got lost, if I got delayed, if I went the wrong way, then it means I maybe wouldn't meet, make one of these mm. destinations mm. before it got dark. What I very quickly discovered was that I could turn up at a village, mm. a town, find the priest, find someone attached mm. to the church, explain what I was doing... Mm. And they would very quickly find me a place to stay, mm. make sure I had a meal for the evening, mm. make sure I knew where I was going. Sometimes it was a bed in the presbytery. Mm. Sometimes it was the floor of the church mm. office. Mm. Sometimes it was a family who took me in. Mm. But it was always possible for me mm. to stay inside. Mm. And maybe because it was colder, mm. people were kinder to mm. me. Mm. So in a way, that it, didn't, it, it became more of a pilgrimage because of that, that kind of you know, restriction that you had on yourself. Yes, I was, I was reliant on the charity of yeah. other people. Yeah, and that presumably gave you better material, in a way. It did, except, as I, as I said earlier, the, the idea of writing a book yeah. was, was really not in my mind yeah, at yeah, that yeah. time. It was, it was 
the experiences like this over the course of the journey which convinced me to to write about it but at the time what it felt as like was that I was getting an insight into these yeah, people and yeah. these places that wouldn't have been possible otherwise yeah, yeah. you know if I'd been able to afford to stay in hotels there weren't hotels the entire way along but if I'd been able to afford that I would have met virtually no one yeah yeah and was there a difference between the countries I mean between the sort of the charitable impulses were some countries more charitable than others can it be revealed <laughs> it doesn't seem polite to yeah. <laughs> rank the countries first to last the thing that everyone will understand is that if you're in a city and you go up to someone and say can I stay the night in your house you're they're probably going to say no mm. and with good reason mm. if you're in a village and you go up to someone and say can I stay stay in your house they might still say no obviously but they also understand that if it's getting dark, if it's the end of the day, if you're obviously travelling on foot, if they say no, you're still going to be kicking around in their village. If there's no hotel or, or guest house in their village, you've got nowhere else to go. And so that changes people's, the way they relate to strangers and the way they think about hospitality. Similarly, in places where there's a very developed tourist infrastructure, you know, people are less likely to ask for hospitality because there's 13 restaurants available. But if you're in somewhere very remote where there's not even one restaurant, hmm. people are more likely to give you food because they know that you maybe have to walk a while before you can even buy some yourself. Hmm. And what about, I mean, you're walking. I mean, you had suffered blisters coming to Canterbury. Did, did you overcome those or did, were you beset by sort of the physical problems of actual physically walking? On the... the difference between walking for one day and walking for seven days hmm. is huge. The difference between walking for seven days and four weeks is smaller. Mm. The difference between walking for one month and ten months is, is pretty tiny, mm. you know, physically. Mm. Obviously, over time, it becomes more and more mentally demanding. Mm. But physically, if you're fit enough to do a week or a month, then you, know, then you can keep going, provided you keep eating, provided you keep sleeping. <laughs> you can keep going almost indefinitely. Mm. And, you know, at that point, I was, I was 24 years old. I was a young man. So I think... The physical challenge became manageable pretty early mm. on. But because I was walking in winter, what I hadn't taken into account was the challenge of, you know, mountain passes with 10 metres of snow or hiking and being rained on eight days in a row or getting to the Middle East in the height of summer mm. and, you know, it being too hot to walk in the middle of the day. So what was the... Maybe can a, a moment when you thought that, you know this is it it's, you know was it the snow or the heat what was the thing when you thought bloody hell this is this is ridiculous I'm going back. The point at which I was closest to giving up was not actually as a result of any of the external conditions. Mm. As I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I started the journey after this period of mental mm. illness, thinking that it would maybe build me up, that it would help me to recover in some way, and as I kept on going on. For the middle section of the walk, it looked as if rather than helping me to heal, it was in fact making things worse. Mm. So some of the symptoms I thought I'd left behind were returning to me. I was feeling fretful. Mm. I was feeling panicked. Mm. I was closing in on myself. Mm. I'd, I'd not drunk for a very long period, but I was starting to drink again. Mm. And so about midway through the journey, Thessaloniki in Greece, mm. I thought to myself, I actually, I should stop this journey in Istanbul. It's not having the outcome I hoped for. Mm. It would be safer for me to stop mm. walking. But you kept going, and then there was, and there was a change in the, in your mental climate. There was a change. Two things happened. One was internal. One was ex external. The the external one I'll talk about first, which is that when I got to Istanbul, there was some very serious demonstrations going on. The Taksim Square protest, mm. which mm. happened in the summer of two thousand and thirteen. This was the most serious demonstrations that Turkey has seen in its modern mm. history. And there were pitched battles going on in the centre of the city. There were armies of protesters. There were police with tear gas canisters, with batons, um, rubber bullets. Mm. It was a, a very serious event. And I, I guess it was a historic event as mm. well. And just by chance, I was in the city while this was going on. I stayed about three weeks in order to, to witness what mm. was happening mm. and the aftermath. And this just took me out of myself. Mm. Suddenly I was having conversations mm. with people trying to understand mm. the mm. political situation. I hadn't planned on this being part of my walk, but it seemed important to just record what mm. was going on. Mm. And that process of being taken out of myself was 
was obviously helpful. Mm. I'd, I'd become very, very introverted over mm. the, the previous period of the walk. The other thing was a bit subtler, a bit, bit more harder to pin down. Mm. It was internal. But I think the best example of this is when I was on Mount Athos, mm. just prior to Istanbul. This is the monastic republic in Greece where you visit and you you try and live like the monks. Mm. You wake up very early, you go to long services, mm. you only eat two meals a day and you walk between the monasteries, staying each night in a different mm. monastery. Up until this point, I'd found orthodox services hard to understand, to engage with, foreign language, unfamiliar liturgy. Mm. I had no idea when the Eucharist was. Mm. But as I was spending more and more time in these services on Mount Athos, mm. I stopped trying to rationally pick them apart mm. to work out what was going on. I tried to enter a sort of passive or receptive state. Mm. I was still bored. I was still sleepy. Mm. But occasionally I'd move to the far side of boredom mm. and get some tiny insight into mm. what really happened when mm. people prayed, what monks were doing mm. all day. And this, in some mysterious way, meant that when I started walking again, mm. I was thinking less about the destination. Mm. Got to get to Jerusalem. And I was I was a bit more present in the moment, mm. trying to pay attention to just what was going on around mm. me. And this made it easier to, to keep going day by day because I was no longer fixed upon my destination. Mm. I was just taking each day as it came. I mean, that's a fascinating idea, you know, the far side of boredom, because I've, I've heard something similar for people studying martial arts we have to repeat something or singing where uh, you know scales and eventually you, you kind of go through a, a kind of wall and suddenly a whole new area of meaning is kind of revealed was there something similar with with walking I mean it is quite tedious isn't it there's one foot in front of another yes if you're walking say eight hours a day then it's your job and like any job or at least you know, many jobs there's a huge amount of tedium mm. in it so if there were moments of insight or moments of self-forgetting that would be 10 to 25 minutes out of your eight to mm. ten hour day mm. it wasn't that i was in a blissed out state mm. the entire way equally if there were fabulous views mm. or you know a sudden sense of exaltation that would be a brief flash in an otherwise dull week but what i did begin to find was that when i was spending time with these monks for example mm. Before, I sort of thought when someone prayed, they would close their eyes, maybe get down on their mm. knees, and they'd say, please, may I pass my exam, mm. or get a new car, or find a husband or wife, mm. that kind of thing. And as I spent more time with monks, and more time watching them mm. pray and worship, I gained some understanding that these people had an inner life, an inner landscape, and that prayer was the way in which they explored and expanded this landscape. Mm. And that they found resources there that they could then carry out into their everyday lives. So when it was working, they were maybe more patient, mm. more generous, mm. less afraid of death. Mm. And that had some relation to what was going mm. on internally. Mm. That's fascinating. And so did you find yourself praying in, or exploring the inner landscape in a different way? So... I got an insight into it, mm. but I don't think I took the next step, which was mm. entering mm. these these landscapes mm. myself. But what I did take away, and what really helped me with the writing of the book, and I hope and potentially will help me through the rest of my life, is that there is a monastic model for life, which is that, in their cases, prayer is the mm. most important thing they do, the six seven hours they maybe spend praying mm. or, or reading the gospels or whatever mm. form their worship takes mm. that is the most important part of our life and so the rest of our life needs to be structured around that mm. in their cases they often leave the world they often live in poverty very very simple mm. lives and they they sort of shape all the rest of their life to being at the service of prayer mm. and then in a small and modest way when i finished my walk and thought i want to write this book and tried to work out how exactly I was going to live my life in order to make mm. that possible, I thought, well, if I can make writing the the optimal moment in mm. my day, mm. you know, where, where all my resources mm. go to, mm. and everything else needs to really be at the service mm. of that, then then maybe this will be the best way to try and, to mm. try and get better as a writer mm. and to try and get a book finished. And it seems to have worked, because it's a fantastic book, I can safely say. 
Well, that, that's kind of you to say. I mean, the problem is there's a big cost in the rest of your life. Right. And if you're a monk, you know, you're committing to that yeah. forever. You're not going to have a family. You're not going to have any yeah. possessions, things like that. Yeah. I think, you know, as a writer, it's, it's effective for individual projects. Yeah. Whether or not it's a model to live the whole of my life, I don't know. I suspect not. And have you, have you got... I mean, it's always irritating to be asked, what's your next project? But um, is there anything that's on the horizon that you're interested in? I am working on another book at the moment. This book is fiction, so mm. it feels a bit like I'm starting at the beginning again, mm. starting anew. Um, but at the same time, even if, if writing always feels difficult, some of these insights to do with you know, how to live, mm. I think I'm going to carry those through, hopefully, for the rest of my life. Brilliant. Thank you, Guy Stag, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book, and I hope you'll all rush out and buy it. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.